Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode number 15 of Confessions of a Market Maker. I'm your host, Ray, a.k.a. All Day Ray, a.k.a. Rambunctious Raymond. And I'm here with my sensational co-host, former market-making barbarian of 20 years, a man who's been involved in more explicit deals than that that girl walking the street. A man who is now trying to atone for his sins by teaching a bunch of degenerates how to retail trade. (laughs) I'm referring to the Saskatchewan silverback, J.J. Luther. J.J., how's it going? (laughs) Good, right? Jeez. Another caffeinated night, eh? Hmm. Oh, absolutely. You already already know how I do it. And (laughs) today, our guest has spent uh, the last 15 years in investment banking 13 of those at Credit Suisse which, witnessing uh, firsthand the housing crisis. A former online poker grinder in the early 2000s who capitalized on the poker boom, the founder and CEO of Ball Street Trading. I'm talking about Scott San Emeterio. Scott, I hope, hopefully I got that right. How you doing? That's awesome, man. It's an introduction like a boxer getting ready to fight. It's great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, that's, that, that's, that's what I go for. You know, I'm trying to get like the, you know, the, the crowd pumped up, you know, like, you know, the guys walking into the ring and, uh, you know, Scott, I just, I, you know, I just want to start off, uh, with a proposition for you because, you know, I really like what you guys are doing with ball street, right? Um, a heads up match, you know, it could be Texas Hold'em, a game of your choice, whatever you prefer. If I win, I get a position at ball street. Let's do it. Absolutely. And, and, and <laughs> hold them is hold them is the game of, of the day for me. I, I need to dust off some of the Omaha stuff, but uh, anytime you're ready, I would love, love the opportunity to sit down and play a little bit and uh, get a chance to talk more. Absolutely. Now, you know, you know, you know, I joke, but you know, you know, I know I've talked with you before and, you know, said how, you know, real innovating the ideas, you know, and especially, you know, for someone like myself who enjoys strategy, you know, looking for edges and stuff. Um, it's a real neat idea, which you guys got going on. And we'll jump more into that later. But first, you know, I want to kick it off to JJ. Uh, so I could ask you a little bit about your time as an investment banker. Oh, great. Um, thank you for being on the podcast, Scott. It's great to meet you. And, it's great to meet you too. Great to be here. I listened to a whole bunch of your episodes and you guys do a great job. So I've absolutely been looking forward to this one. Thanks. for This is, a, this is another great guest for our listeners. Um, in that a lot of the younger people ask me, how do I get, you know, how do I get on a trade desk? How do I get to wall street? Um, and I am not the best example because I crawled up through the sewers of the penny stock market. Um, so now, you know, this is great for us because we have someone who did it the proper way. Uh, so if you don't mind telling, uh, tell us about, you know, uh, how you got your scar, you know, uh, where you went to school and what kind of motivated you to, to get into Wall Street? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, I'm a kid of the 90s. So when I was younger, it was pretty simple. I asked my parents, how do I get rich? And my mom turned and said, you go work on Wall Street, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I went to undergrad in Albany and I graduated undergrad in 2001. Um, and during that time, this is now late 90s, early 2000s, internet boom is going on. Everyone is making more money than they know what to do with with, uh, with with tech stocks. I have a, a bunch of friends of mine who are all now day trading, which was, you know, everyone was finding a prop desk. They were jumping in there and, and making literally hundreds of thousands of dollars as a 22-year-old first year out of school. So obviously, I'm reaching out to all these guys saying, guys, I, I need to get on these desks. I, I need you to really do whatever you can to put me on. So I had a couple of offers uh, to then get my licensing that summer after I graduated and then jump onto a desk and start trading. But then 9-11 happens in 2001, and all of those offers now fall off the table. Um, so I spent, yeah, so I spent that summer, I got the licenses, the fall comes, everything sort of evaporates. A couple of months later, um, through another friend of mine, his brother had been trading for the last couple of years. He invited me to come onto his desk. And I mean, back then it was as chop shop as you get, where it was just a bunch of guys, like literally like in a basement downtown on Wall Street, where they would literally open up an account where you had it, you were able to trade 100 shares at a time. If you were successful for a couple of days in a row, they gave you 500 shares of a certain list of stocks. At the time, it was mostly NYSE that we were allowed to trade. Um, It was both the best and worst experience ever. I mean, there was nothing more exciting than getting there every morning waiting for that bell to ring. But at the same time, you know, I didn't know what I was doing. I wasn't making any money. Um, I was commuting at the time over two hours each way from my parents' house because I had just graduated. So it was this weird time of sort of seeing what the potential 
is, mm-hmm. um, but really getting kicked in the teeth every single day. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's uh, th- that's something else. And how did you progress from the chop shop to to a white shoe environment? Yeah, so you know, wanting to you know, the goal at all times is always to be how do I get on to a trading desk? How do I put myself in a position where I can take risk on myself and uh, you know get up that that food chain in Wall Street? Because I think what a lot of people don't understand or at least um, can see from the outside, and certainly I didn't have this type of perspective, is that when you go and you work for an investment bank, like the investment bank is a large organization. So it's sort of like the Yankees. Um, you know, you need people to pop popcorn, you need people to sell popcorn, you need people to sell tickets. There are a lot of jobs on Wall Street, so to speak. Um, they're not all going to be glamorous. They're not all going to be high paying. Um, and it's really trying to figure out how do you put yourself in a position to have the opportunity to get one of these really marquee jobs, which is getting on a desk and then ultimately getting the ability to have your own risk book where you can ultimately make some of that real money. Um, so for me, I bounced around. I was uh, I spent a year at Deutsche Bank, a year at Morgan Stanley, and a year at Bear Stearns, um, basically doing consulting work there, getting a feel and a lay of the land. Um, oh. Then, yeah, so then I took a year off and I played poker pretty much full time. This is back really? during the boom. Okay. Yeah. Back during those days, um, you know, I was I was at Bear at the time, and I would leave Bear and I'd go home and I would literally grind all night to like two, three o'clock in the morning. And at a certain point, I was making more money playing poker than I was at Bear Stern. So I said, you know, why am I going to work every day? Wow. Tried to do that for a while, but um, you know, looking back, wasn't really as disciplined as I probably should have been. Um, and now at the same time, this is now two thousand five. Uh, I have another group of friends who are all at Credit Suisse, all in the mortgage department. And they're now coming into their own from a career perspective. And they start telling me about all this great stuff that's happening over there, especially in this market, because this is now the uptick in all of this securitization of all these mortgages. Mm -hmm. And uh, I go over there and uh, they bring me on. My first literal job that I had over there was creating those pay-as-you-go contracts that you saw in the big short that Christian Bale's character was shopping around. Yep. Um, so literally it was creating the credit Swiss version of what that contract looked like back then. Those were like 30 page documents outlining all of the different, I guess, both risks and opportunities that both sides of the trade were taking. Um, I got my first taste into that space. Um, having, yeah. So then having that experience with that specific product, um, and having my friends who were able to pull me up onto the desk, you know, it's, it's almost not enough these days that you can't push yourself too many places, you need to certainly have people on the inside to pull you through. So people who are, I guess, trying to figure out what's the best way to get into some of, some of these organizations, um, it's hard. It, it's really hard. And it gets a lot harder. It's, it's, it's much harder today than it was yesterday. And it'll be a lot much harder tomorrow than it was today. Um, it, it's finding those that network of people that will help you give you the inside um, information on when the desks have openings, what specific skill sets you need to have to have those types of conversations. Because Pretty much, if you're going to go and have one of these conversations for one of these high level um, positions, you're going to really need to know your market stuff. And that goes across, you know, obviously equity, fixed income, FX, whatever you're really looking to get involved with. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you're competing with some of the sharpest minds in the country. So, uh, and it also internationally too, because that's the other thing too. I mean, I've been on the desk. I went to Albany, right? So, at the state school in New York, I've sat there and had the head of the desk turn to me and say, Well, we're going to bring some interns and analysts on. Here's a big stack of resumes. Um, Why don't you go pick everyone out of Harvard and you can throw the rest in the garbage? That happens. That that, that happens. It happens all the time. Yeah, that, 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 that would make sense. So, I would assume because I'm sort of a, a mechanic. Um, that's what I was in the market, and I think by the way you started actually compiling these documents and these contracts probably gave you a heck of a lot of insight into the mechanics of the whole situation. I guess eh? it certainly gave me a perspective when everything started to fall apart because everything you know when those days started to to really creep in, uh, it was let's go back to the contract and see really where our liability and what our obligations are. So knowing the mechanics of how the trades actually work and what's triggering all of these things, it's a little bit different than just understanding what the spread is, right? Against back yeah. in those days, you know, against LIBOR, it's there's a lot more intricate pieces to putting these trades together. And when you understand all of the different nuances to them, um, it certainly gives you a better perspective on how you want to handle or take that risk on or, or push some of the risk off. That's fascinating stuff. So when you started that, did you have any experience with contracts or is this something that you 
Um, a little bit, a little bit. Um, I had done some work with uh, some of the legal teams at Bayer and at Deutsche Bank. So when I was there, it was one of those things that I was able to draw to. And they said, well, we have this new product. And I know you guys, I know you know a lot of the people in the mortgage side of things. So it's probably a good fit for you to be able to then have access to those guys and be able to sort of see the market as it begins to mature. It's interesting. I, I just, uh, I'm fascinated by this because in my career, I've always noticed the guys who are into the details who have actually read the paperwork where most, a lot of people don't. It's scary how much a lot of people don't uh, are the ones who, um, you know, they're able to see the market a little bit differently because they know the underlying mechanics of what's going on. Yeah. It's funny back in those days that uh, when all the headlines, when all the CDOs started to blow up, that no one knew exactly what we had to do. So it was literally let's sit around the room and pull the contract piece by piece. And it was nice to be able to have that background, to be able to understand exactly what every line item um, ultimately required us to either to ask of a counterparty for us to actually do ourselves. Yeah, that's, that's, that's very, uh, yeah, that, that, that's a great background. That's interesting. So you, um, so you went from writing those to actually being on the desk that, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it took a, it took a couple of years, um, but yeah, to continue to to work through to ultimately um, was running the P and L for the subprime desk from two thousand seven um, to about two thousand ten when I came off, um, and that was you know that was the, the rise and the fall of of the chaos of what mm -hmm. that time was. Um, you know, looking back now, those those days, those were 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 just crazy, crazy days. Just the hours alone, like I would probably get there around seven every morning and literally wouldn't leave till 11 or midnight every single day. Oh, wow. That, that is amazing. That, that is really amazing. Um, people don't really realize the, uh, the time that you guys put in. Um, I, I know I had friends when I was younger who worked in investment banking and, and their hours were just insane. They would just work them like, you know, rented meals. Oh yeah. Yeah, you know. three three meals a day. It was like almost like prison. You sort of you get there three squares a day on the desk, and uh, you're just waiting for whatever chaos is going to hit you that week. So when did when did you leave the street? Uh, I left Credit Suisse in 2000. Well, I guess if, I guess last year, 2018. Um, okay. So it was a, yeah, so relatively recent. When I um, you know part of what the experience taught me through the crisis was that. Especially being in, in you know mortgages, the idea of a long and um, illustrious career in Wall Street is probably not going to serve me the next twenty years of my life. So I began to, whether it was consciously or subconsciously, figuring out how I was going to escape, for lack of, a <laughs> way, lack of a better way to describe it. And that's where you some know. of the some of the, the the seeds started to get planting from my poker days, and and you know some of the stuff with uh, that was at the time was happening with DraftKings and FanDuel. Is how do we create sort of a, a better way to to watch and experience sports? Mm. Mm. Okay, that, that that makes sense because, of course, naturally, and then all the young guys are like, "Oh my God, why did you leave?" You know, um, and and for someone like you, you'd be, you know, what, you know, you'd be a partner or a managing director status, um, you know, in the old days when they actually had partnerships, yep. um, you know. So, um, was did you did you find that it was sort of wearing you out, or well, it was just I think it was more of the you know. After the crisis happens, you, you sort of live in this new world where the pay is not as great as it used to be. We're living in the post uh, Dodd Frank legislation, which means that it's much harder on investment banks to make money. Um, at Credit Suisse specifically, we had a change in CEO, um, which really affected the direction and the vision of the company. We went from more of an investment banking focused firm to now more of an asset management, specifically out of Asia based firm. Got it. Um, so there really wasn't that much of a. Uh, incentive, quote unquote, to stay, you know, I certainly wasn't, you know, older now, wiser, it wasn't necessarily killing myself every day when I went in. Um, that's only because now I got very good at both the network at CS as well as you know, the specific roles and, and functions that I was asked to do on a day to day basis. Oh, that's great. Well, thank thank you very much. It's really informative to, to pull that layer off and, 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 you know, get it, you know, straight from the horse's mouth with the especially a lot of our younger uh, listeners who are uh, trying to find a way in. And, um, you know, I, I, I got influenced by Michael Lewis's Liar's Poker in the early 90s. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and when he talks about that book, he, uh, you know, he says, I wrote it as a warning, <laughs> not, <laughs> not, not for recruiting, you know? Yeah, I would, I would say, be careful what you wish for. I mean, I, I look at uh, Michael Lewis, and you know, with the big short, like I literally lived that. Like that was literally my, my life. And, you know, watching that movie play out now, uh, all these years later, um, I don't know if it necessarily glorifies it all, but it was 
I don't want to say scary at the time. I don't know that we really appreciated how much damage was being done. Exactly. Right. It, it, exactly. It, like at, at the time, I don't even like to say like it was, it was fun. It, it wasn't fun. Like we were literally there in our seats for 14 to 16 hours every day. And, um, if you know, you look back now and you really see exactly, um, the, what was left behind and it, it's, it changed everything pretty dramatically. And I don't think people fully appreciate the new wall street that's out there, at least certainly on the buy side. On the sell side, sorry. Definitely, definitely. I'll let uh, I'll Ray I'll let Ray uh, take over. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Interesting stuff. Yeah, just you, Scott. Like, like you know, while you were going through like that time through the crisis, like, what are some of like the like the feelings, the emotions that you were going through? Like, were you realizing the magnitude of it while it was happening? You know, it's funny. I was actually having this conversation with someone a couple of days ago, and I think it was uh, the combination of we understood how bad it could be. I don't think we understood how bad it was ultimately going to get to be. And I remember specifically one day, um, so being on MBS, we were on the, the fixed income floor. So equities um, was on a different floor. So everyone on that specific floor is all fixed income. And it was the day that the Senate voted down TARP for the first time. And before they started rolling those votes, everyone was sort of, I don't want to say joking, but we were sort of tongue in cheek saying there's no way they can vote this down because we all understood if they voted this down, all hell is about to literally break loose. Mm -hmm. And then they start putting, you know, so CNBC, you have, um, you know, they're they're watching the Dow and they have, I guess, C-SPAN up and all you see the votes start coming in and all of a sudden it sort of hits everyone like, oh my God, they could really vote this thing down right now. And next thing you know, the stock market starts to tank. And then it, the realization hits that they are going to vote this down. The entire floor is on their feet. No one is talking. Everyone is just staring at the TV, watching this in complete disbelief, just watching wow. CNBC and watching the stock market. I think the stock market fell like a thousand points that day. And this is, like I said, it's a fixed income floor, so no one's trading equity. So we don't necessarily have to be on the terminals doing anything. But I just remember that moment, just looking around at everyone's face, no one saying a word, everyone just glued to the television saying, I can't believe this is happening right now. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Incredible. Um, you know, from my experience, you know, like talking to JJ and, you know, reading some of these, you know, books, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm obviously, I'm real new to this whole space and, you know, I, there's, you come across like all these characters, you know, I've heard JJ speak about them plenty of times. I mean, JJ himself's a character. Uh, he says you come from like more, you're like more in like the white shoe area, but you still encountered those types, I imagine. Yeah. It's funny. I mean, coming from Credit Suisse, the only person who got arrested and this whole mess was was a Credit Suisse guy, Kareem Sarah Gelden. I actually I, I sat down the road from Kareem for a good two years. Um, I used to actually send the PL to Kareem every single day. And a, a funny little story, I don't know how funny it is maybe at the time, but um, it was Friday before uh, President's Weekend. Um, this is 2008, I guess. And my boss's boss comes over to me. So this is Friday. Everyone's getting ready to go for the long weekend. He comes over to me. He's like, hey, he's like, I need you to do me a favor. I need you to not send Kareem the p l tonight. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, really? I'm like, I'm like, I'm half like not really, I don't want to say not paying attention, but it didn't really strike me as, mm-hmm. as you know, why am I not sending Kareem? They're like, you need to send it to blah, 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 who are running the New York desk. And it, Credit Suisse at the time, there was a London-based desk and there was a New York-based desk who had two different risk profiles. So what the New York New York guys were doing with whatever they wanted to do, um, that would go against their PL, and whatever the London guys doing, that was completely segregated uh, set of assets. So again, this is holiday weekend. I'm getting ready. I'm actually heading up to a Mohegan Sun with some friends and my parents to go play poker for the weekend. So I'm like, sure, no problem. I, I won't send the the, the PL to Cream, not a big deal. Um, so Fast forward to that night, um, I'm sitting there playing poker at Mohegan Sun and my phone starts ringing and I know it's a Credit Suisse phone number. And I'm like, why is my phone going off at 11 o'clock at night on a Friday of a holiday weekend? So I pick up the phone and it's this woman. It's like, hi, um, I forget her name. I'm the secretary for Mike Ryan. And I know the name Mike Ryan. Mike Ryan at the time was the global head of investment banking at Credit Suisse. So I'm like, oh my God, why are they calling me at this particular time in the middle of the night? <laughs> And she proceeds to say, uh, Scott, so I know that you look over a couple of these books or at least know the mechanics of these books. Uh, Mike Ryan is asking for you to come back to New York tomorrow morning because we're having uh, a meeting about you know, some of the portfolios. And at this point, I'm like, all right, well, I'm in Connecticut. I can get, I'll come back to the city early. And uh, you know, when do we really need to be back? And she's like, I need you back in New York as soon as possible. So I'm like, okay, this is a little strange. Hang up the phone. 
call my boss's boss. I'm like, hey, I just got a call from Mike Ryan's office. Do you know what's going on? They want me back in New York tomorrow morning. He's like, what are you talking about? He's like, oh my God. He's like, well, get back to New York as soon as you can. That morning, my parents take me all go back to uh, to the city. And I walk into the trading floor at the time. There are probably maybe a dozen traders um, and all C-suite level people at Credit Suisse, like super high level people. And I'm saying, wow, this is not something that's good right now. Mm. And uh, they proceed to tell us that the London books have been getting mismarked for the past couple of months. And we now need to go line by line, look at every QSIP and every swap that's on the book and revalue everything because they think they've been mismarking everything. So at this point, there's probably, I don't know, maybe a dozen to 20 different books because the way Credit Suisse has their investing banking set up, it's, it's across a number of different entities. So this isn't easy enough to go to a, a spreadsheet and sort of line up the QCIPs and tell you where you think the bond is marked. So this is a much more in-depth process that took literally the entire weekend to go line by line and reprice everything in the portfolio. Monday around you know evening time, it's the holiday weekend, so the markets are closed on Monday. I walk into the uh, the head office there on the floor, and I slip him a piece of paper. And uh, the books that I was writing down uh, came to about two hundred and fifty million dollars. I slid him a piece of paper. He looked at. It, he sort of laughed. He said, "You didn't want to say this out loud." I said, uh, "You know." At this point, I'm like half delirious. They have a big whiteboard with all of the books and just negative seventy five, negative one eighty, negative two hundred. And that was all of the write down that Credit Suisse ultimately would take. Because then on Tuesday, when I wake up and go to the office um, that morning. Front page of the Financial Times, Credit Suisse takes a $2.9 billion write down. And that was all of the bonds that we just wrote down all weekend long. So Kareem, I don't know if you necessarily put him into the, the back alley type of, type of guy. He was genu- genuinely a super nice guy, super, super smart guy. I think they just got themselves in a position where they didn't think the market was as bad as it was, or they at least potentially thought that it had hit the bottom and was going to bounce up and then maybe they wouldn't get caught. Unfortunately, it was really bad timing that the market continued to accelerate down. Um, and then those prices got caught up in obviously first quarter earnings that they published and uh, they had to then ultimately recall. So it was, it was, a, it was a really big deal, um, certainly at the time. And, you know, for him to get, or for him to be the lone person that, that, that went away when all this stuff is, is kind of insane when you think about it. But uh, yeah. So, I mean, that was that whole, that whole weekend was just absolutely wild. And then having to come back and sort of explain to people what exactly was going on, because now you have literally half of the assets under uh, Credit Suisse that, uh, you know, are being marked at 80 when realistically the street is marking them at 25. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy, crazy stuff, man. I appreciate Scott, you, uh, you sharing that time uh, in your life uh, with us. And now, uh, you know, I want to ask you about what you got going on right now. You know, I was, I was hyping up a uh, ball street before. Um, so, so why don't you explain to everyone, uh, you know, what ball street trading is? Yeah, Ball Street, uh, we've created a real-time prediction market that lets fans compete against each other during any live event. Effectively, we're letting fans buy and sell shares of their favorite teams based on win probability, trying to create that unique and immersive experience for anyone while they're watching any game. Our markets trade from 0 to 100 and act much like a, a binary option where the shares of the winning team expire at 100, shares of the losing team expire at 0. So as more buyers perceive that a specific team potentially has the opportunity to win, those shares should go up. And as people witness whatever team is playing, play pretty poorly, those shares should ultimately sell off. The beauty of, I think, what we've created is this completely peer-to-peer. And the prices are only driven by the traders in the market itself. Uh, The other thing is that we've really gone out of our way to design a simplified approach to a market experience. We want this to be as approachable as possible to the guy who trades for a hedge fund, as well as the the casual sports fan who doesn't really know markets or the difference between a bid and an ask. So mm-hmm. what we've done is, is really simplify and remove all the decision making to where you simply have to ask the question is, who do I think is going to win? I'm going to buy some shares of them. And if you want to change your mind five minutes later, we give the opportunity to do that too. Right, right. You got you got that, JJ? Indeed, I do. <laughs> no, I, stuff. I, I, no, I just stuff because he was like, well, you know, he was like, I have no idea what this is all about. <laughs> <laughs> right. well, the thing is, I, you know, I, I was sort of, I've, I've been one of those guys who's been in a cave for the last twenty years, <laughs> and um, so you know, they had to explain fantasy football to me, and uh, you know, along with a, a bunch of other pop culture, which, uh, which he still doesn't understand. <laughs> yeah, okay, I know who Bonsafe is now. But, yeah. but um, you know, Beyonce is Beyonce. Beyonce, Beyonce. I'm sorry. I <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah, no, it's great. It's, I was always, I'm always fascinated by this stuff because it's, yeah, no, I'm, 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 I'm busting, I'm busting your balls, Jay. No, um, 
Yeah, so, you know, how did you, you know, Scott, like, like the, the, the fascinating to, uh, thing to me is like, how did you make the connection like between sports and trading? Like, where does this, how does one, how do you come up with an idea like this? It was a combination of the seeds, like, you know, I, I played a lot of poker back in the day and there were certain aspects of it that I really enjoyed back then. I, I was a huge sit and go grinder. So I would literally just oh, fire okay. up a couple of couple screens and just drop as many tables as I could and just play through all of those. So uh-huh. Back when I was trying to figure out a, an interesting way to have a competitive way around watching a sporting event, went back to my need, at least in poker, to have some sort of level of control. Um, yeah. Betting sports, at least conventionally, right? If I'm going to bet on the Jets or on the Mets and they look like you know they're, they're terrible when the, when the game starts, I'm sort of stuck. So I wanted something where I had control, whether I was going to put my chips in or take my chips out, fold, raise, those types of aspects I wanted to put in. And obviously with my market background, um, it, it seemed to be a natural way to think about things. Um, I know in Europe, there's match betting through Betfair, um, but in the US, you can't do that. Certainly, the CFTC will have some issue with that. Uh, and this is all also pre-PASPA. So there were some issues that were, you know, or at least there were ways that I needed to approach this that wouldn't get us into any sort of legal or regulatory um, conflict. Mm-hmm. Um, so what we basically did was we created this contest structure, much like a poker tournament, right. where it's specifically this vacuum of activity that you're only going to rank against those players who are trading you in, in that specific game. Uh, we then went through and created uh, literally an, uh, a market where uh, players had to fill the book. So you had to put a bid, you had to put an ask. We had a, a beta market a couple of years ago. People came back and said, listen, I, I love the concept, but it's actually kind of confusing and kind of distracting. So we took about a year really fine tuning the design to make this more of a simplified uh, approach to things. And uh, people have, have genuinely really liked this uh, approach to it. Because I think when we think about sports betting, the idea of betting against the house is one that will eventually fade away to much more of this peer to peer now that I think the technology is there that we can support it where you don't have to worry about betting against MGM or DraftKings. You want to bet against the market where you um, get certainly better odds um, because you don't have to pay the negative 110. You can pay much more of a, a financial spread where it could be as little as a couple of pennies. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I, I, and I, I think, you know, that's the exciting part, to, at least to me, is because like you – and I'm sure you still play poker to this day, but you were a poker grinder. Like you were, you were a player and like, that's something you find a problem with poker is that you have people who weren't like, they run, you know, the operations, but they weren't necessarily players themselves. And so they don't, they don't understand these aspects, um, that what the players want. And, um, so I find that real interesting and, you know, you know, I've played around with the, the app before I played some of the games. Um, am I wrong in assuming that it's better to have some trading experience, um, and skill over sports knowledge. I think if you're asking two people to play for the first time, I would certainly pick the trader over the sports fan. Mm-hmm. Um, that that being said, I think the learning curve that we've created is relatively short. I think what we found is that there's this light bulb moment when everyone sort of sees exactly what they have to do to be successful. I think if you're someone who understands some of market psychology, game theory, you're going to understand a little bit more quickly, probably how and why you want to buy certain things. Like one of the things that I think sort of surprises people is like, if you're thinking about an NFL game and Tom Brady and the Patriots have the ball on the 20 yard line and they're trading at $60, every first down, um, more and more people are going to think that they're going to go into the end zone. So they should be buying more shares. So as that drive goes, that price goes from 60, 62, 63, 65, 66, 67. Now they go into the end zone, touchdown, the price spikes up to 70 because you have all the late money coming mm-hmm. in. And then you have the price sell off to 65 because you have everyone who has been buying the entire time and they get to take the profit. So just like a normal bull run where you have those moments where you buy the dip, um, people are coming in and using actual market theory. And it still blows my mind to this day. It it happens every single day, every single market. And it still amazes me that we've created a rational market for in a basically free to play model using sports as the backdrop. Yeah. 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 No, it's, it's, it's real neat. You know, I, and I was talking, I was talking with, um, with Matt, uh, shout out to Matt, um, about like some of the strategy, um, you know, like how much thought have you yourself, uh, put into the strategy, like thinking about like GTO, you know, and that's, that's game yeah. theory optimal for, for the fans out there. that don't know what that means. Um, yeah. How much have you put into it? Like trying to analyze it? Cause I feel like, I feel like you can go like super deep into this and, and maybe, you know, I'm not as experienced. So. Yeah, I would say, you know, I, I wish I had more time to do it. Um, I think when I first put it out there, there was a lot of different nuances that I would see and I would pick up on part of 
you know, what I'm really waiting for is when we get to scale and there's a lot of really smart people that get on the platform and get to really pick apart the game theory. Right. But every time we sort of see little things that uh, we can ultimately give it out to the masses to make them better traders, I think overall makes the market experience that much better. Like little things like for it, the way our market works is um, every time there's a new low in the market, that should be an opportunity for you to buy. Right. Because you now have an opportunity to buy the cheapest shares in the market, which should drive your weighted average of those shares lower. Um, something like that, that maybe wouldn't be intuitive to someone because you're saying, oh, this is a new low. I should probably be looking to sell. But the reality is you should probably be looking to buy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Like, like, and you know, at least from my experience playing, you can see when it starts, like people start getting a little like irrational, um, you know, at certain moments in the game. And, and I think, you know, at least capitalizing on those are probably like the easiest, you know, the thing that at least stood out to me. Um, Right. That's, I mean, that's trading one one right. Just figure out when the market, when the market's wrong. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, is it, is this something that you imagine, you know, looking into the future and, and assuming you guys, you know, take off your successful, is this something that you imagine that people could like, you know, equating this to like DFS, people could grind this or poker, grind this for a living. Um, what do you think? I think that would be one of the, the broader goals for us. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I think, for us right now, um, in this post passive world, it's really difficult as a startup to go into the real money gaming side of things. That's why we've decided on this free to play model where we're going to leverage the engagement that we get as a marketing tool for brands and sponsors who want to come in and tell their story during these live games. Through that, we'll be able to take that ad spend and give that back to the players to create that incentive and that prize pool. Um, I think as we look to our day two business model and hopefully be able to bring on a strategic partner that will allow us to explore real money gaming, we can be in a position where we have games as low as $5, $10, $50, $100, $1,000, as long as the demand is there for players who want to come in and play at those stakes. For us playing, uh, paying out a flat democratic payout, you could in theory have um, a $1,000 buy-in and a 1,000 players playing, um, and you could then have 200 players each winning $5,000 each. Mm -hmm. So that's real money. And I think when you start putting it into those types of terms, you're going to be in a position where no one's turning their phone off, no one's changing the channel, and you can certainly have people making a living playing this type of concept. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. You know, you know, good luck to you guys, you know, because like when I first spoke to you, like that was the first thing that like, you know, you know how guys like us think, you know, that's the first thing I'm thinking. I'm like, oh, wait, hold on. Is it, this could be like poker in its early days. This could be like, you know, uh, DFS before it exploded. You know, it's like things like this, you know, to capitalize before people have, you know, everything figured out, like the strategy and whatnot. So, you know, I, I wish you the best of luck. I think it's real, uh, real interesting, unique um, idea. Um, and for myself, I want to I ask you just, you know, just something about poker. You said you were a sit and go grinder. Is that what you primarily played or anything else? Uh, I mean, I would, th- I would probably throw a lot of money away playing the big multi tables, trying to win the big uh, Sunday, Sunday millions on stars yeah. back in the day. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I mean, you know, at least I, my um, success was, was primarily in sit and goes. Um, and then, you know, I was notorious for making lots of money in sit and goes and then go playing, you know, 10, 25 <laughs> heads up and, lo- and losing it all. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, the sit and goes, did you play uh, like uh, six max? Uh, well, six max. Six, six max. max yeah. Okay, cool. Now were you like mass multi table and how many tables would you have up? uh eight to ten yeah i was playing i was playing a lot yeah yeah, yeah miss me was a sicko good. yeah yeah no that's good I, was, I mean i remember back i mean stars and then obviously way back uh i was a huge party poker fan like that was just something about party poker that that interface that just felt very video gamey that was also something that i always had in the back of my head when, when doing the ball street stuff like i wanted to sort of feel like this video game fun first yeah. um experience you know, you know, that's, that's when I really, you know, and, and I'm a little bit younger, Scott, you know, I, I you know, I, I missed the, you know, the, those boom days really. But I, uh, I first fell in love because I used to watch, I would sit behind uh, my dad while he would play and I would watch him and that's what he played on party poker. And oh, yeah, man. just watch him. Yeah. He, was, he would play limit. He played like the, like the 10, 20, 20, 40 limit games. And I would just sit back and watch him. And I was just like, so fascinated. And uh, yeah, I remember when I, when I, when I first started playing in the casinos, all they really had was limit back then yeah right. so i used to go mm-hmm. i used to go and play like 10 20 limit and that was you know that was the game that that i was oh, that at the time got pretty good at and then all of a sudden the money maker stuff starts happening and now every then every table goes no limit and uh you know everything begins to, to shift a little bit and then just this massive explosion of i don't want to say it was easy enough to print money but games were good yeah <laughs> games were really good <laughs> yeah yeah uh, absolutely um you're not you're not playing this frequent do you still once in a while 
Uh, I live in New York, so it's, it's, I certainly don't get an opportunity to play online. Um, I'm a part of a couple clubs here in New York and get an opportunity to get down to Borgata every once in a while. So I try. Nice. Nice. How's, how's the, uh, how's the live scene there? Uh, the it's good, man. I mean, mm-hmm. I mean, it, it's good. It's competitive. Everyone's really good these days. So, you know, you sort of go more for enjoyment, um, more than going to sort of win a couple dollars back in the day. Every time I sat at a poker table, I expected to win. And if I didn't, I got upset. Now it's more of a, I'm going to kill a couple hours. And if I don't get killed, I'm happy. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, man, it, it's, it, it's crazy how, you know, efficient, I guess, poker's gotten, you know, with the strategy and whatnot. So yeah, that's definitely why I'm looking to transition out. Um, yeah, so uh, so going back to Ball Street for a second, I have you know I, I've been seeing some of these like I think DraftKings ha- just had a um, they did a partnership with the NFL. I wasn't too aware of that. I think maybe I saw something with the the Capitals uh, having a deal with a with a, another wagering company. Is this something that you guys are looking to capitalize on as well? Like with the emergence of like sports betting, et cetera. Was this in the back of your mind when you created this? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. So, you know, all of this rush and acceleration of capital into this space, I, I think is really going to change the way people experience sports, whether it's betting, fantasy, or, or something different. Um, I think all of the partnerships that are going on right now, hopefully set us up to be in a position to capitalize on those once we get our uh, our, our reach out there and we have um, fully functional markets with, you know, it's called five, 10,000 players every single game. We've already started conversations with a number of pretty big national brands um, to hopefully bring them on through pilot programs to offer their ability to, like I said, tell the story to our players, um, as well as create that prize pool of positive brand recognition that they ultimately can get by being part of one of our um, experiences and one of our live events. As far as the leagues, um, we've been in conversations with a couple of league entities and um, those would obviously be huge accelerators for us mm-hmm. to get our name out there because, you know, what I think we're already starting to see now is this um, adjacent industry where you're not quite gaming, um, but you're not not gaming. And I think we fit nicely into that to where so there's, yeah. you know, right, there's millions of people who who want to gamble but can't gamble. Um, and there's millions of people who like the idea of gambling but don't gamble. Um, you know, I think you know, this concept of gambling as this really negative um, thing, it will eventually dilute itself away it over, it, over the next couple is. of years, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Right? right. So so with that, then we have an opportunity now to sort of sit in this space where we can scratch that itch for everyone who wants to have a little action or a little something on the game. Because if you're betting from an entertainment perspective, there's no one who can argue that it's not fun, right? Uh-huh. Even if it's five bucks, exactly. like it's better to have money on the game than not. So what we're hopefully being able to do is we're going to give you a compliment or something to do along with the game that you're both going to get the ego trip out of beating 2000 people who traded the Yankees um, or even winning, you know, 50 bucks, a hundred bucks, 200 bucks, or even 10 bucks. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, you know, it's like it, on July 4th, I was, you know, I was watching the fireworks, um, you know, and then I realized I couldn't bet on it. So <laughs> before I left, so <laughs> you know what I mean? So no, I, you know, I, I couldn't imagine, you know, it was like now every game I watch, like, like tonight is going to be the Rams in uh, Seattle. Uh, I'm going to play a little draft Kings. I'm going to pull up ball street. You know, it's just, yeah, like you said, it just makes, it makes yeah. everything more, more enjoyable. makes it more interesting when you got a little skin in the game. It does. And we, we want, we want people to open up the app and they want to see thousands of people. And I think it's much more of an interesting story to trade against 15,000 people while you're watching the Rams game um, versus betting, you know, 50 bucks against DraftKings or against FanDuel. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. But you know, maybe that's just a degenerate in me talking, but who knows? <laughs> but <yeah. laughs> We all got a little degenerate. In yeah. Us. Cause, cause you know, cause you notice when, when I said the fireworks bit, JJ didn't laugh. So cause he, he's, <laughs> you know, like in our trading room, he's like the real, like, uh, you know, strict, you know, no, you know, uh, straight lace guy, but no, it's it's all good. Um, so well, like, that's, every time I break the rules, I get I, I get put through the spanking machine. So yeah. it's just it's just easier for me to you know have discipline. Yeah, you know? no, no, for sure, for sure. Yeah, we're just joking around. Um, last question here, Scott. You know, I, I was re- I was reading the interview you did with uh, you know, Beyond the Trades, and the question you were asked was about like your favorite saying or message, and you chose a, a notorious Big lyric uh, from Sky's the Limit. You know, anytime I have a guest on who's a who's likes hip hop, I ask them for their uh, top five uh, dead or alive. Well, I'm a New York guy, so I mean, mm-hmm. it's Biggie's going to be up there. Uh, I'm also I'm an older guy at this point, somehow, some way. So it's probably going to be all chalk. I would say it's Biggie, Pac, Jay, Kanye, and maybe Rakim. Okay, all right, yeah, that's a good list. <laughs> I, I, I love he said all chalk for. <laughs> 
<laughs> I don't even know if people out there know, know what you mean by that, but no, yeah, the, it gave the chalk answer. Yeah, that's that's funny. Uh, all right, that was a good list. That was a good list. Um, all right, yeah. And with that being said, we got we got some listener questions. Um, so we're gonna jump into those, and you know, sure. Uh, like I, I tell you guys every week, um, we encourage questions. You guys get in there, ask us any type of questions, trading, non trading, whatever. Get your question in. We enjoy asking them. And um, so today, the first question comes from Ben uh, from our Micro E Minis Future Room, um, and so he goes. So first, it's uh, Ray. Uh, how close are you to becoming a full-time trader and getting out of poker? Uh, if you had to put a time frame on it, um, I don't know. I, I don't know if necessarily putting a time frame on it is the best way of like looking at it. Um, I, I guess when I start, you know, making consistent income that's sustainable. I mean, I don't know. What do you guys think? What do you think is the best way to go about it? I, I would definitely not put a time limit on it. Um, right. I mean, learning to trade is hard enough in the retail sense. I mean, on the institutional side, we have so many tools. Retail traders, you know, you're out there with a Swiss Army knife, you know, with guys with bazookas and and cruise missiles. Hmm. So, yep. you know, putting putting a time limit on your uh, ability to be consistent, it's uh, that, yeah, it that's a tough one. Yeah, it doesn't seem conducive. What, what are your thoughts, Scott? Anything? Yeah, I think time should in no way be part of this equation. I think it's going to be really looking at the strategy and the plans that you have when you look at the market every day. Are those plans successful? And then are you disciplined enough to literally live that life to where you're seeing the setup, you're making the trade, and then you're going on to the next one? Um, I think I sort of think of it in terms of like the matrix, right? When you get to see everything. I think there are moments like that, mm. but in today's markets, there's probably thousands of them. So if you only if you see only a couple of them, I don't know if that's a good enough reason to all of a sudden say this is what you're going to be. Uh, this is going to be your only way to make income, so to speak, and, and do this quote unquote full time. Um, but you know, the discipline to be able to follow through the plan and do you really believe that the plan you have is a strong enough one to sustain you um, in a professional sense? For sure. For sure. Okay. Now this, now this is this question is also from Ben. This is still going on, and now this is, is going to be for you, Scott. Um, during the housing and financial crisis uh, of 08, how worried were you about your positions being able to perform through the downturn, or were you seriously concerned about the faults? How does the transfer over to today's market and things to come? Um, any knowledge to be shared? Yeah, I mean, I think back then it, it wasn't. I mean, I was working for the bank. So it wasn't really my position, so to speak. It was more of a, am I getting fired today? Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> like, like, um, you know, the, the, the reality of where I was, we had all of the chaos going on with the London side of things. So, um, at, at CS on one level, we were sort of safe if we knew where all the assets were and how we were going to ultimately get rid of them or potentially even put more specifics, uh, sp specific assets back into, into the portfolio. But, you know, it, it, literally when I say every week, you just see people walking around with folders, man, meaning they just had their meeting with HR and they now have to leave the building. Um, that's literally what it was like. Um, they were picking up entire desks and just letting everyone go. So, you know, the positions certainly were driving probably those decisions. Um, but at the end of the day, it was literally, you know, I don't care if, if, if something went, if the bonds went down 5%, it's literally, am I going to have a job tomorrow? And then in this in this chaos of you know 2008 2010, it's not like I can just go to any other bank. Like every, this is this is happening everywhere. So it got pretty scary pretty quickly. Mm. All right, and sh uh, shout out to Ben. Ben, thanks for the questions. Uh, we appreciate you. All right, next question comes from uh, at Donkey Trading or at Trading Donkey. Uh, why doesn't JJ post pictures of himself trading in the VIP airport lounge or videos of himself accompanied by smooth skin? <laughs> So, <laughs> accompanied by smooth skinned caramel women draped on his body while trading for Machu Picchu. <laughs> Seems oh, to work God. for other trading gurus. <laughs> well, first of all, I, I am definitely not a trading guru. I am the furthest thing from a guru. I, I am a student of the market. And, um, but secondly, honestly, I'm too ugly for uh, for photos. I'd break the camera lens. Oh, and no. uh, thirdly, some of my clients may still be alive and not be hiding in out in outer Mongolia. So um, you know, there there is that too. I, I don't want to you know one he's, day just Scott. Sort he's of so full of it. Scott. He's so full of it. Like I, <laughs> I I get like I get like a little like my ego gets bruised a little bit. You know how many messages he gets uh, from this podcast from uh, you know. 
the women of finance <laughs> and I get zero. You're making that up. You're making that up. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, all right. Uh, it's, that, it's that sultry voice. Exactly, right? <laughs> it's the voice. Even my ex-girlfriend commented on it when she listened to the podcast. Crazy. Anyway, shout out to Trading Donkey. Uh, we appreciate the uh, colorful question. <laughs> next, uh, next question comes from at Artemis X23. Uh, this is uh, Zero Suit in our, our uh, Micro E Minis Future Room. Shout out to her. Um, Ray, uh, you recently went live trading using Market Profile, and you're being very patient and cautious to be able to take only the best trade you can recognize. What part of your poker background you think is helping you accomplish what I mentioned above? Specifics, please. Um, I don't know. I mean, the, the one thing that at least strikes out to me is that what I, I'm seeing some like the newer people struggle with is kind of more of like either bankroll management or, uh, emotional issues. And like, like me and JJ talk about all the time. We talk about like dealing with your, uh, demons, right? JJ, that's how we phrase it. Um, Definitely. like, like, like whether you want to call it gambling or just risking your money brings out some like neg can bring out like negative emotions. And, you know, I, I play, I've played poker for years and I've had to deal with that with poker. So, you know, I think that maybe gives me a built in edge. Uh, I would like to think. And um, yeah, I mean, I've just had experience like risking money and like looking and identifying edges. So yeah, hopefully that answers the question, Diana. Um, and yeah, shout out to you. Um, next question uh, comes from, oh, you know what, you know, before I move on, Scott, I, I wanted to ask you, dude, what, what skills do you think you learned from poker that maybe helped you on the desk? I mean, I think, it, I think you were just touching on it. it it's discipline. It's bankroll management. Um, I, I think I look back, you know, from from the years uh, playing poker, and um, if if I could go back and and sort of shake myself and say, just don't be an idiot half the time, and you'll be able to keep most of this money. But you know, <laughs> yeah, it, it didn't exactly work out that way. I, you know, but but literally, if you're able to stick to a plan and be disciplined every single day and really come at it like a job, um, it, that, that to me, that's half the battle. Right, right, exactly. Treating it like a job, like that, and. JJ, that's what you've been saying all the time too, and yeah, that's it's not sexy. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's, it's if, you're doing, if you're doing it the right way, it's not sexy. It's you should be bored. Right. Oh yeah, definitely. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, right. right. There's no, there's no glitz and glamour. Like I always like, you know, at least try to pride myself on just being a grinder. You know what I mean? Like nothing glamorous, just day in day out, do your job. All right. Um, next question comes from at buy side trade. Uh, would love to know what it's like um, during those final days when Lehman was going under, how did it affect his company directly or indirectly? Yeah. So when Lehman went down, that was actually over a weekend and we all went in that weekend and we basically pulled apart the portfolio. Um, we sort of did the best we could to reconcile the systems versus the on desk risk management tools that we had to really understand what positions we had on or against Lehman brothers. And it was just basically the same question over and over again from the, from the higher ups. Are we in the money or are we out of the money? Are we in the money or are we out of the money? Um, because, you know, when you're thinking about the different, you know, the derivative trades where you have all the different potential assignments, truly really trying to understand exactly how much exposure we have to Lehman Brothers, because when you look at all of the way the contracts are set up, it's just this big web. And we might not be directly have exposure against Lehman Brothers, but we might be against a fund that has lots of Lehman exposure, which we now have to think about and how we have to position ourselves once this whole thing unravels. Um, so that was another one of these long weekends where um, you were just hoping every time you got asked a question that you had the right answer and that you could back it up with some sort of data that uh, that proved you to be right because you certainly didn't want to go and say, oh, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> yep. All right. And shout out to Buy Side Trade for the question. We appreciate you. Um, next question comes from at M Trading Media D. Uh, Ray, how did your poker news podcast that you appeared on go? When is it being aired? Um, I was told it was going to be aired today. Um, I think it went well. I mean, uh, I guess we'll see. I don't know. I guess it's kind of, it's kind of different when you're the one who's getting interviewed. So I'm not really sure. Hopefully it came out. All right. Um, the host was very gracious. She was very nice. Um, she seemed very interested in trading. So that, that was cool. Um, so yeah, hopefully we you know we can bring some of the, uh, other poker players who are like myself looking to transfer or find something else to do with their life. Uh, hopefully we can bring some of them over to us. All right. Uh, so shout out to D. Thanks for the question. Um, next question uh, comes from uh, Gapa, AKA JJ son. 
Um, yeah, yeah. This this is Gapa from our uh, our trading room. Uh, so, this question for JJ: uh, As a newer trader to profile, how would you uh, say you are ready to transition to a bigger, more serious account? How would you know if you are actually getting good results? Um, well, that's it. Definitely the consistency in your PNL, um, the amount that you're drawing down, um, the amount that you are. Um, making good decisions to get out of a situation when you see it immediately going against you. Um, you know, it's sort of a whole package, right? I mean, your PNL is going to be the number one thing, but that PNL is the result of, of all of that discipline and everything that, you know, that you're putting that big picture together from knowledge of the market, knowledge of yourself. Am I taking emotional trades? Um, you know, most people will know. Um, you know, when, you know, you're, uh, we're talking about a, a young gentleman here who's actually in university. So he's, you know, he's just starting out on his journey and he's doing really well. Um, so I, I don't, you know, I don't think it'll be very long, you know, but just be patient. You know, remember this is a marathon, you know, they're, you know, you're, you're in your twenties, I'm 50 and, you know, there are guys who are, you know, in their eighties who are doing this. So, um, and they've been doing it for 30, 40 years. Um, so try not to uh, rush it. It's very easy to say, harder to do. Yeah. But, you know, especially when you're young and, you know, you see, um, you know, this is the society we live in where everyone's got a Lamborghini. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's hard, but the discipline will pay off in the end. And, um, it, you know, for you, I, I, I honestly don't think it'll be long, you know, but it's consistency. It's that day-to-day -day consistency. Um, and today we had a gentleman in our room who said, you know what? I didn't do my homework last night. I'm not trading, right? When you start doing things like that, then then you will know, you know, and that will reflect in your PL. Right. Right, for sure. Yeah, no, I, yo, Scott, yeah, Scott, this guy, this kid, we're trying everything in our power to keep him in school. He's a uh, he's itching. <laughs> he's itching to drop out of university, but you know, to be a don't trader. do that. Don't do that, my man. Don't do yeah. that. Listen, <laughs> it, everything JJ just said couldn't be more true. Patience is going to ultimately win this one. It it just it just will. Just take it for fact. You might not like it, but yeah, keep him like. He's a good. He, yes, he's a good. He's a smart. Stay in school. Yeah. He's a good. No, no, he's actually hasn't been in the the, uh, the room as much, so we know he we, yeah, he's right. been in the books. So he's, shout he's out actually been in class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, if he drops out of school, his mother and father are going to come up from Mexico and just <laughs> lay a licking on us. So they, you know. No, you're not going anywhere. Stay in school. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, no. And we get that. We get that a lot, actually. Uh, a lot of the younger guys I talk to, ah, oh, this university. I don't know, man. This is, you know, I could see the market. I'm like, no, no, no. Just, just finish your degree, please. <laughs> the market will be there. Yeah, it's not going anywhere. You know, we're not going. Anywhere. Hey, we're, not, we're not closing up shop. Uh, well, hey, school is for fools. You know, look at me. Yeah, great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, shout, out, <laughs> shout out to yeah. Gapa. Uh, much love, Gapa. We appreciate the question, man. Thanks. Um, and the last question here comes from at Pyro Davis uh, in, in our room as well. Uh, what's the proper approach to paper trading so that it leads to successful, uh, successful living or a successful live trading? Uh, how do beginners go about determining a proper account size to begin with? Well, uh, for the guys that are trading the micro, you know, you're trading one or two contracts, um, you know, and when you learn how to manage a position, you take on maybe three or four. Uh, so you're not putting a lot at risk. You know, it's a dollar and a quarter a tick. So, I mean, with one or two contracts, um, you know, I, I definitely would start out with that off the simulator. The simulator and paper trading is only for really one thing is when you're testing out your edge, right? You're learning how to use the software. You're learning how to enter orders in, in the order book, how to move your stops around, um, you know, and then, and the nice thing is, you know, what we can transition you to the, to a live trade a lot quicker than with the e-mini, um, you know, because if you have a bad day in the micro and you, you know, you trade like a drunk sailor, Right. Uh, and you lose, you'll lose 50, $60, right. As opposed to 500 or 600 in the mini. So, uh, you know, as soon as you start understanding, you know, 
the uh, the concepts that we're teaching you about structure and, and inventory and, and those things during the day and the context of the day, um, you know, you can start and just stay small, you know, um, mm-hmm. it's, and it's a patient. Yeah. I mean, and the other thing I would, uh, you know, just like to add to that is uh, there's no PDT rule for, for what we trade as well. So for people with, you know, the barrier to, the barrier to entry um, is a lot smaller just to add on to everything else that, that Jay mentioned as well. Um, so yeah, shout out to Pyro Davis. We appreciate the question. Um, yeah. And uh, that's the end of the listener questions. Um, and yeah, with that, we're going to wrap it up. Um, just a reminder, um, everyone listening, if you guys could rate and review it, um, if you enjoy the podcast, we'd really appreciate that. Um, and yeah, um, Scott, appreciate you coming on. Appreciate um, everything, all the knowledge you shared. Uh, wish you the best of luck with Ball Street. Uh, JJ, any final thoughts? JJ, you still there? Can you hear me now? You there? All right. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. And I was just asking any any final thoughts. <laughs> no, I was just saying I, I didn't know whether my mic was on. Uh, no, thank you, Scott, for coming out and helping shed some light, um, you know, on the process and uh, the experiences you went through. We really appreciate that. We, it's nice to have access to people who have actually, uh, you know, been in the fire. No, this was great. I, I had a ton of fun. It was great talking to you guys. Uh, certainly any way I can help, uh, please just let me know. Happy to help uh, shed any light I can. You know, I, I come out of this industry now and uh, like I was saying before, hopefully never have to go back in. But uh, for everyone who's who's still thinking that they want to get in, I would say really do as much homework as you can of not only the, the assets that you're going to go into, certainly the uh, firms that you're looking to to explore um, because Wall Street is a very big place and it's not all, um, you know, the wolf of Wall Street. And it's not all Gordon Gecko out mm-hmm. there. Mm-hmm. And uh, also also for the listeners that are interested in, you know, following you or signing up for Wall Street, uh, tell them where to go. Yeah, I would appreciate if everyone gave a, a look at Wall Street. We have games for marquee NCAA games. We're going to start doing the Major League Baseball playoffs and uh, obviously football on for the NFL Thursdays, Sundays, and Mondays. Um, BallStreetTrading.com on Twitter at Ball Street App. Uh, me personally at Ball Street CEO. Happy to talk to anyone about anything from Ball Street to trading finance. If you have any specific questions, um, happy to answer those. Anything about poker? By all means, I'm not as uh, as polished as I once was, but uh, can certainly dust off some of the uh, the old school stuff. <laughs> for sure, for sure. All right, all right. And with that being said, for sit and go, Scotty. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good night. Have a good night. later, boys. Thanks. <laughs>